Great, so let's get started. So we're here um, for the launch of a report called From Paris to Beijing, Implementing the Paris Agreement in the People's Republic of China. So in the years since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, there have been conflicting narratives around the implications of China's participation in the agreement and questions about the true nature of China's carbon commitments. Furthermore, the extremely complex nature of national government, the national government and subnational governments, in addition to the involvement of third party groups, makes these issues very difficult um, to untangle. So we're extremely fortunate today that we have these three panelists who are extremely well qualified to speak um, on these issues from a number of different perspectives. First, we have Craig Hart, who is the author of this report that we're launching today and that you should all have a copy of. Um, next, we have Professor Wang Zhongying, um, who, um, who is the Director General of the Energy Research Institute of the National Development and Reform Commission. And finally, we have Dr. Wang Tao, who is a China strategist at the Climate Works Foundation. So in order to kick us off, I'm going to ask Craig um, if you could say a few words. Um, first of all, just giving us an overview of the relationship between the national and subnational governments um, and their cooperation on implementing climate policy. Jennifer, thank you very much. Um, but before starting, I want to say a few words of thanks uh, to both our panelists for participating. Thank you for coming a long way for this, um, and to the Atlantic Council who uh, supported this report. Um, Randy Bell, David Livingston, um, uh, and uh, Jennifer and the colleagues have been terrific support and given me uh, uh, not only strong edits but also uh, intellectual uh, freedom to, to write, so I appreciate that. Um, there are few countries that matter as much as China to the ability of the planet to meet the global climate challenge. Um, US and Europe and Japan are certainly in that group, but, but China is almost singularly unique in that it is, um, at the moment, the world's largest emitter on an absolute scale. And even on a per capita basis, considering that China has a population of roughly 1.4 billion people, on a per capita basis, China is um, now roughly the equivalent of the European Union per person. And that has implications. It has very serious implications, which I'll say a few words about um, uh, in, a, in a moment. But climate for China has evolved from being an area that was largely uh, the work of technocrats, academics of the last 10 years to being raised to the level of a topic that uh, the, the president and, and chairman of the party, Xi Jinping, uh, and uh, Premier Li Keqiang speak about. Um, they have claimed this as their, as, as a topic for their leadership. Uh, and when in China the paramount leader uh, makes public announcements and promises, that has implications. That has implications in any country, but for China, it has unique implications because the, the, the system of government, the way that things operate there. Um, and in particular, it, it, it raises concerns about transparency. Um, from an exterior point of view, uh, the international community uh, needs to know that um, claims that are made in terms of progress towards meeting NDCs are being met. Um, and, uh, and for um, organizations such as, uh, as uh, um, Wang Tao's, you know, they, they need to know that uh, where, to, uh, where the help is needed internationally. And then domestically within China, it has dramatic implications because when the boss says, this is what we've promised, then everybody in the, you know, in the system knows that this is what needs to be delivered. And China has, I have been teaching in China for um, Renmin University and Tsinghua University for, for, you know, since seven years back. And we've always had an issue with data. My colleagues, these are my Chinese academic colleagues, have, we've struggled to get good data. And so this has impacts on data collection and the accuracy of information. And um, 
And if you look on the report on page 16, I think it is, there's a, there's a chart, we like to use charts in the work that we do uh, on subsidies. And, you know, if there was one word that described the Chinese economy, the political economy, in my mind, it's the word subsidy. Mm -hmm. Subsidies makes the world go around. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so this has deep implications for the way money gets spent, too. If you don't have accurate information, you're very likely to waste resources. And if you believe that climate is a, a real problem, uh, then you know you know that every every dollar or R and D or euro or pound that is you know it needs to be employed. It needs to be employed rationally. And you know again, having been an academic in China um, and my first role at Renmin University, People's University, at the School of Environment, which is an economic shop basically. You know, we we're very concerned that uh, money gets spent rationally, and when um, emissions targets are claimed to be met or uh, are set, that these are really there's real accountability throughout the system. So, you know, now, now going back to the external, and I'll wrap up with the explanation. But this also has, from an external point of view, the transparency has very deep implications for. Um, China's foreign policy as well. Now, when when the paramount leader makes a statement that climate is going to be the centerpiece of our foreign policy, that means that climate becomes a topic for the propaganda bureau, and it means that it becomes part of the new cycle that is in fact controlled through the propaganda bureau. That raises some concerns about again. Um, you want to make sure that claims are, are accurate, progress is being made, and we can track and monitor that. And for China, this has some deeper implications because it negotiates as part of the G77 group, plus China in the international negotiations. And many of those countries are small island developing states or highly vulnerable countries, LDCs. And they are as dependent upon China's efforts in this as they are upon the US, Japan, Europe, Australia, what have you. And so, you know, for China, it has to, um, it, it, it does need to evolve its positions if it's going to maintain um, a parity within that negotiating group. Because again, its emissions profile is starting to look much more like Europe than it is a developing country. So this has farther reaching geopolitical implications for alliances, not only within the negotiations, but I think farther than that. And I think in context, that's why we look at China. This report is a subnational report. It's not the, the national report. There's another publication that I write called Mapping China's uh, Climate and Energy Policies, which is in its fourth, going into its fourth edition. That treats China from a national policy perspective. This looks at within the government, within the, the but below the national level, the SOEs, the, uh, the subnational uh, uh, governments, provincial and, and municipal and local government, how the policy process for for um, climate uh, operates, and I'd say it's it's kind of a light brush because China's that complicated. With that, I hope that gives some context. Thank you, um, Professor Wong. Um, I would like if if you could speak to us a little bit um, about the role of the National Development and Reform Commission in formulating climate policy. Um, and also if you could talk about your other governmental partners, um, especially the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, um, or anyone else that you see as being particularly important in um, creating and crafting a climate policy. Um, how to say, um, just from the real situation of China and Nigeria, Utilization. Uh, uh, for example, first, heavily depend on the fossil fuels. Uh, it, uh, I think uh, last year also maybe eighty six or eighty five percent from oil coal uh, from coal oil and uh, natural gas. And for coal, uh, still in the, I think the 60 percent, 60 percent. 
and things uh, since the earlier of the, this century, our environment are very go to the very bad situation. Uh, it's uh, for the population, for the people, worry it is. I think the since the twenty twelve years, twenty twelve. That's uh, for example in Beijing. Heavy smoke, PM 2.5 issues. That's uh, that's the, how how to say you cannot imagine that the situations. This is uh, so. Uh, this is the first uh, the energy mix. Second, for energy security, for our oil import seventy percent. I think last year. And uh, natural gas also forty percent, I think, last year forty percent. So this is for energy security. Uh, security also the very serious for the government issues. Uh, the third one, so far the central government already put the environment. Protection, ecological constructions, and counter construction priority policies. So, in this is the situations in past uh, five, I think the in past five years, China renewable energy that is a big development, big development. If you can have that, I can show the solar. Solar development trends. If you can have, that's uh, just uh, show that. Very few the twenty seconds could uh, show the that development trend. No, I think um, is it possible for you to speak to us because this is such an interesting thing that you're picking up on, um, and that that you're um, that you've brought into this discussion um, about the role of renewable energy in China. Could you talk a little bit about the way that the government um, has been supporting efforts? For to, you know, to promote uh, solar or um, other other sources of renewable energy. I give you the example. Just uh, he mentioned the uh, six, sixteen page sixteen about the government subsidy for the. As he says the in, uh, state in stated industries. I have in China. Solar PV, the big manufacturer is private. Most private, private enterprises. In past the, the ten years, uh, to, uh, especially in past the five years, get the how to say when when they develop the get the we follow the Germany tariff policy, uh, feeding tariff. They get a lot of supports, supports. That meaning the government gives the market, give the market solar PV so they can produce more and more the PV panels and this. Uh, so th this is a very good evidence. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and. So, from the perspective of the non-governmental organizations and academics, I don't know if you want to speak, um, Dr. Wang, first, first as, a, as an NGO representative and then as an academic, or if you can, you know, wear both hats, um, perhaps at the same time. But if you could speak to the role of third-party advocacy, I suppose, which maybe is an umbrella that can encompass um, both of those groups, and talk about the relationship um, that third-party advocates may have with the Chinese government and the extent to which you're able to to influence, but also opportunity, you know, both both challenges as well as opportunities um, to, to to pushing forward climate policy in China. Thank you, Jennifer. That's a very um, broad question, <laughs> and I do urge you to remind me um, during my process of uh, answering that um, in case I off track a little bit. Um, Yes, as you just described, I have been to the academia and also the NGOs in China before I moved to the Panorama Foundation. 
uh, from the other side to push for the change in the Chinese government uh, and for better and stronger ambitions on climate change. Um, this is a very unique situation if you really look at the NGOs and the um, academics in China. Academics in China. Um, on one hand, we all know that Chinese economy is a very strong planning economy for a long time and still may remain some of those habit of tradition of planning. So that's why we still have five-year plan every five years and they really come out with this target. And that target means the targets you have to meet. I think uh, Craig made this very clearly in his report. Some of them are kind of like mandatory targets. If you didn't meet, you got punished. And some of them are indicative targets and, and you try very hard to meet, but if you didn't, um, nothing bad will happen. Um, so people start to know how to live with this weakness of the planning. But on the other hand, I think there is also a very strong, uh, very big space for the NGOs in China to work with government to push for those changes. We all know that this is more or less like a bottleneck when Chinese government announced something. Um, and the environment for quite a long time was struggling, the environment NGOs are struggling to get their space to push for the influence they want to, um, to uh, reflect the issues. But I think, as we just heard before, Chinese, the middle class start to get more awareness of the um, environment and also the welfare of their qualities. They actually push them back and feedback to the um, government. And also the um, connections with international NGOs uh, in increase the capacity um, to find the best way to influence. So I would say that NGOs in China, especially in the environment areas, actually have very strong connections with Chinese government. Or shouldn't say connections, have very strong influence uh, channels to make that happen, and especially on climate change. And there's also for a reason why climate change is such a uh, topic that we actually could influence. Um, but in general, I think this is very different to many people would like to think about the NGOs in China, uh, which they are actually with operating with very limited spaces. But in terms of climate change, that is actually a very good example. We used to say that the Department of the Climate Change is one of the most internationalized departments in the whole Chinese government. They understand the talking, they understand the international norms, they organize routine communication with international NGOs and, NGO, and domestic NGOs. But that didn't come at the first place, and, and first place without any struggle. They actually changed their attitude exactly after 2009 in the Copenhagen, when China was actually become a, a scapegoating um, scapegoat for the failure of the Copenhagen Accord. And then they realized that actually there is a lot of space and need necess necessities for government to work with NGOs, to international NGOs, to domestic NGOs, and also academics to set the target. So I would say they are very, very strong. And the academic on our side is also very different. Um, in most of the um, world, you say academic is more independent to the government. Whereas in China, it's not as independent to government because they are all state-owned and their head are actually appointed by the party or government. But that also gives you a niche to influence them because they see them as the insider, as the people they trust. So we, as for example, the financial pays or NGOs, we can work together with the uh, professors in the universities, we come up with research, we convince them this is actually achievable. And uh, through this building up of the trust, you will be able to fit that information into the very internal decision making process. And in many cases, like climate change, some of the professors from the Tsinghua University are exactly the negotiators for the government. So you have a very good channel to make this message heard or even adopted. So that has been proved very successful. But of course, now we are facing more and more. A challenge to raise the ambition. So we are also working very closely with um, Chinese partners uh, to help that, to, to maintain this and to, to increase uh, our future influence on these issues. And challenges are there, but uh, we are also um, very uh, prepared to give us our support to Chinese capacity um, on that. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for mentioning the five-year plan, which I think is one of the things that comes up um, in Craig's report that you know over and over having to rethink um, what the policies are going to be. So, um, Professor Wong, could you speak a little bit more about um, the role of the the NDRC in in crafting the five year plan and how you think about putting climate policies in, and then other stakeholders who may or may not um, you know also have have a voice in crafting those policies, but specifically geared towards the five year plan. I 
是 Fire Plan 还是 The China Characteristics？ 因为 China is a big countries。Uh, I, I don't know how to answer you these questions. Uh, uh, the government, uh, for example, NDRC, that is the uh, responsibility for the China macro and economic management. Every industry, each industry. Uh, the government, I think the, in the world, the government is the uh, the possibility, the uh, possibilities, the response, uh, how to say, uh, their task, I think that's the same. They more focus on the this year and the next year. No more, I think, that normally no more than two years. Two years. For example, if you send the strategies published, launched, maybe some the end, uh, enterprises you know the labor job lost, maybe they will complain to the government. So in our country, the government also depends on the how to say the social stable issues. So, so if we talk. Paris Agreement, climate change, green energy. That's a long term, long term issues. So if you, you want to combine together, it's difficult. Uh, but you can from all the how to the uh, communist is the conference from the 18th, 19th communist conference that already made decisions on China future development strategies. That's what I before mentioned. Priorities, ecological and the environment is the priorities. So, if we go to the country, the NDRC, for this year task, next year task, NDRC more focus on the economic development. But in the same time, we have the Ministry of the Environment. That's right. So any projects, you must meet our environment standards. So, since uh, I think just I mentioned the since uh, 2012, 12 years, our environment standards are more serious than the serious so far. So far, more serious than serious. This is the first. The second, NDRC that's the fully support renewable energy development. But you know, any industry, any kind of field, any uh, energy industry, if you want to develop, you must based on market. Market, you cannot depend on the sub subsidy to develop. So even so, well in Denmark and Germany, they they change their policies about the uh, feeding tariff and, and some of the. Uh, they go to the competing, competing market. So for our side, and the RC, they they also go to the, this direction, go to the market, go to the market. This I want to say. Second, and uh, very just uh, follow, follow the I said the priorities. Now NDRC has a very clear strategies. The coal consumptions, we have a, you must reduce the coal consumptions. The second, next step, we will reduce the oil consumptions. consumptions. So this is, uh, how to say, maybe 
I don't know everybody understand that is this year task and the long term strategy I buy together together. Yes, please. So it, it might help to just take a step back and um, realize that in the in the spring of 2018, there was a government party state reorganization. Um, climate was moved from the MDRC to a newly created Ministry of Ecology and Environment. But NDRC retained the very critical energy portfolio, and it also retains other responsibilities for national planning. Um, and by cleaving off the climate responsibility to the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. Um, it, I always thought it was very rational, by the way, that NDRC controlled both. Um, it, it, it did create a tension within the NDRC between, obviously, developments and climate, but it kept everything in one under one roof. Now, um, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment is faced with the task of driving climate goals, but the most important policy China currently has for reducing emissions is the energy conservation targets that are still set by the NDRC. And although it's not published, there's internal, there's internal assessments that estimate ballpark, and we're going to be publishing on this in, in March, that it roughly about 80% of the reductions are due, in fact, to those conservation targets or energy efficiency targets. Um, so NDRC, even though it doesn't have formal responsibility for climate, still has incredible influence over meeting those goals, both through the energy infrastructure that it controls. And, it, and when, um, when Wang Zhongyin said, you know, we support renewables, well, I, one, another way of putting it is NDRC approves all of the power plant permits, and they make the decisions what goes in and doesn't go in. So they have enormous authority. Um, the, the only other point I'd, I'd like to just add to what Wang Zhongyin said is that you know, that five-year planning cycle is, uh, is complicated, I, I think. And, and first, they're set uh, at a very high level uh, in very general terms, and then it's filled in over the course of the five years. And I, I take it from uh, uh, Wang Zhongyin's remarks that there's, a, there's some flexibility to make changes based on economic uh, conditions as they come up. And so it's a very highly, even though it is centralized, and, and the, the central planning apparatus is alive and well, uh, you know, that should not be underemphasized. There's still flexibility in implementation uh, at the lower levels and within NDRC. But that too creates somewhat of a transparency issue because we never know what the true state of play is that can be evolving. Uh, I can complete when you information. Uh, for example, in, in, China, in like, uh, solar PV development, the NEA National Energy Administration make, make a five-year plan. Uh, that is a 35-year plan. That is the objective is uh, 2020 solar power capacity will should uh, reach the 110 gigawatt. But two years ago, I think, uh, uh, yeah, 2017, we already reached 130 gigawatts. So, some people will be curious, what's your meaning of your NEA five-year plan? Why you do this five-year plan? Your goal is 110 gigawatts. But I, the market before the three years, they reach the goals. So that, that's the, sometimes, sometimes you, you listen to this, you see this, that's a joke. But on the other side, you can say that the government is how to support Renewable energy development in the chat. That's our one. Um, 
I just, I just said, I know these guys all know this, but it just hasn't come up. I first went to China in 2004 uh, as the head of ACOR, the head of the European Renewables Industry, when Arturo Zorbos, and the head of Renewables for the European Commission, Wolfgang Paulswank. And we all went to work with, uh, with uh, Li Jinfang and uh, Chen Haiyan and that gang uh, to write the Renewable Energy Law for China, which Li Jinfang wrote. Uh, but we coached them because we had PERPA in the U.S. and then we had feed-in tariff in Europe, and so we were there as a friend to, to coach, and we spent in the first trip like, two weeks in meetings, crafting all this and just trying to provide the U.S. But we learned, uh, an interesting thing was one of the working group, uh, we learned, was a member of the party. And he was sent there to be in that group because all this came down officially through NDRC. But in reality, it was coming from the party. Okay? And uh, Li Jinfang was the assistant director, deputy director of the Energy Research Institute within NDRC. He was tagged to write the document. And uh, what I learned in that was that there is a party, and uh, we're not supposed to know this, but it has maintained a 100-year plan about where this is going. And it's updated every five years. And out of that update comes the five-year plan ordered to, to the state council. And it, it is the implementing arm of the 100-year plan in five-year increments. Okay, so that's a short-term implementation. But there is a 100-year plan. It's updated every five years. And there are certain people from the party infused into the, into the system of bureaucracy unannounced. They're, no one knows that they're a member of the party. It's a deep secret that they're a member of the party. So I just wanted to add that, that there is this 100-year plan. So to me, the president uh, said climate is part of the Chinese thing means it's been adopted by the party. Chris mentioned that in his report. In fact, the part sorry, you know that. So. Yeah, the if you read the report, I think I'll just speak for Craig. Uh, um, the the party part influence is actually explained very clearly by his report that the organization is by the party to control the promotion and punishment yeah. of the company. So you've got them in the yeah. So, so I didn't know about the hundred year plan. Oh. <laughs> Has anyone seen that? I mean, when I, when I, when Craig's I, going to source you for his next report. When I, when I was told of the 100 year plan, I, I, it was the guy who told me said that, that he, could be, he could be killed. But, but you know what, I think, I think what we're picking up on, um, and that I'd like to get into, you know, this, this tension and this push and pull between, you know, what's a long term plan, what's a short term plan, and how do you balance um, as Professor Wong mentioned, you know, the, the long-term environmentalism against the short-term need for jobs. And Greg, I'm, I'm about to pick on you again, don't worry. Um, but so one thing that um, I think we're kind of hinting at that, that Craig really, really brought out um, very strongly in his report is the influence of industry. So I don't know if that's what you were about to say. No. I was going to say markets. Markets, okay. Well, could you speak a little bit um, about markets, but also please um, speak toward, you know, speak to the influence of industry that you that you got out in your report. So our uh, so markets is a hot topic right now. It, from the time of the twelve year plan, which is the plan before to the thirteenth, markets have been introduced as a policy uh, emphasis, and right now. Uh, members of China's uh, government are, are under pressure, I think, to develop uh, market-based approaches. That's in line with themes coming out of Paris. It's also something that China recognizes it needs in order to help rationalize um, its own economic circumstances. Um, you know, markets make a tremendous amount of sense for allocating resources more rationally, right, according to the way people want them. I mean, you've got 1.4 billion people, you should be listening to those consumers. Now, the problem is is that it, <laughs> implementing markets in in a, in in, a, in what is fundamentally a a centrally planned economy. Okay, and as, as Michael's pointed out, if there's a hundred year plan, boy, it's a planned economy. And then you've got down from there, you've got twenty and thirty year technology plans that are public, and then you've got five year plans. Uh, and then sometimes you've got two and three year plans on individual policy topics. So it, it's all kind of an interlocking nest of, 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 of plans of multi-year dimensions. And 
So for example, you've got a three-year plan right now on, on, on uh, air quality. Okay. Now, with that in mind, it, it's tough for folks that are accustomed to having that kind of power in the bureaucracy to just lay off and let markets do their job. It, it just goes against everything you know, everything you're used to, everything you've been trained. And although I do think there is a, um, a young group of very um, you know, up and coming um, individuals in government, and, and this is where again the role of, of you know, going back to Wong Tao's comment about the importance of the NGO sector, incredibly important in this. They have collectively moved the ball in ways that you cannot imagine. You know, the government listens to these NGOs. It doesn't always like what it hears, but it does in fact listen. And it's an important group of up and coming uh, capacity and knowledge. So going back to this idea of are we going to do markets or not? Um, well, here's the kind of the fundamental challenge. You've got within the NDRC, you've got the pricing department. They control the prices of electricity, coal, steel, and labor. In fact, is even you know set by a, uh, a schedule. Basically, all major inputs, land, all of this stuff gets in one way or another is influenceable or even directly set. Um, then you've got you know, uh, an effort to create a carbon market. And in, in what I would consider to be a blizzard of subsidies, the Chinese government is trying to set a price signal, a, a flashing red beacon that industry is supposed to see through all of those subsidies. And it's, it's hard to drive to that beacon when in the middle of you know that that drive, you're in a snowstorm of subsidies, and money's getting thrown at you for all different reasons. And of course, you lobby for that money. So, markets don't come naturally. Um, I think to either the people in government or industry. Which you know, if you're in a position, if you're if you're if you're positioned, and if your competitive advantage is lobbying the government you are going to do what, in fact, you are good at doing. And that is, you know, if you can take money from the government, your state-owned enterprise, you're going to do it. So there's a fundamental problem with all this. And, and I think one of the reasons why I work on China and work on it, you know, within the context of Chinese organizations as a state employee of a Chinese university, Chong Yi, you have that in common, is that we see, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> We see, a lot, at least I see with the colleagues that, you know, that I work with, a lot of waste. And it's bad for China, and it's bad for the environment, and, and it, it doesn't make, it doesn't improve the situation by any means. So, um, so markets are, I think, in a very tenuous position. I, I want to turn this over. I've said enough on markets. Um, actually, if we can, if we can actually pivot um, quickly because I do want to be mindful of everyone's time and I, I do want to open up the floor for questions. Um, but I had one last question um, for Dr. Wong about kind of being, as both of you have talked about, you know, affecting change from the inside, but if you could speak again about trying to influence change um, from the outside, but also from the vantage point as we were talking about before, um, from San Francisco and looking towards China, but also in this context of the United States having essentially abdicated, at least you know, from the administration level, abdicated leadership on climate, um, and then now within the context of trade tensions. Um, so if you could speak to the US-China relationship and what that means for climate. I know that's a huge topic and we, should, we could sit here for another two hours. Um, but if you could do that um, quickly, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I think the shorter version of the answer is it's very bad. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I think on the uh, brighter side is also that you do recognize that the U.S. is also as complex, if not more, than China. So even though the uh, federal level is actually backtracking in their commitment of climate change and also uh, become more and more difficult in terms of the trade and innovation and investment on climate change against China, um, there are still a lot of positive things going up, but of course we want them to turn back in the future and the nutrition of the federal level will actually help in that. But I think just as you just mentioned, Michael, the um, experience that we had with working with Chinese government um, just vividly indicated how actually the state government, especially like California, um, 
as a pioneer of the climate policies could actually help China to understand and learn the new experiences and best practice of promoting renewables and uh, learn from the experience from other partners and to develop the new programs for that will suitable for China. All this actually was still happening and even happening more um, with urgency because they saw the um, backtracking of the federal government actually calls for more actions from the non-state government, uh, from the non-state players, from the philanthropies, from stronger connections between the academias and also the entrepreneurs. So I would say that um, this is a challenging time, but we actually are uh, very confident that we will come up with our efforts to help this um, to move forward and then uh, whoever uh, change the mind in the federal government level um, I think the first, the world largest and second largest emitters are, are still well positioned to take leaderships on uh, responding to climate change and that is for sure and I think this is duty for us at this moment uh, from um, various experts, uh, actors to 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 um, sugar during a difficult time like this. Thank you I so much. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, please. Just relevant now. Just wait one moment so we can give you. Sorry. Uh, something happened a year and a half ago that was very illuminating, and that is uh, city's chief economy, chief energy economist at Morris came out with a forecast that peak consumption of coal in China would not happen in 2030, it was going to happen in 2020. This was big news, that his analysis and was very good. And uh, he was asked to come to China to present it, and he couldn't because he had other complications or something. And um, I got a phone call from China from a powerful person who said, my friend Mr. Morris doesn't understand. He has to come yeah. because, because the state council is forbidden from considering any information that has not been presented in China. It is not permitted to reference a report in California. And Ed's in New York. I said, well, I'm coming to China next week. I called Ed, I said, Ed, you want me to give you a PowerPoint? He goes, yeah, please, thank you. Fine. So I gave the presentation on Ed's forecast of coal, and therefore it was presented on Chinese soil. Therefore, those important people could take it into the state council. Because it was a point they believed was true, but Ed's forecast was the first part of the forecast to reach the same conclusion. So the state council then changed the five-year plan because of Ed's forecast, which could not be recognized. And it's very interesting. That, and so therefore, WWF uh, is, is the major NGO in China, and they built it up because they understood this. So. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Yes, please, but um, again, please wait for the microphone. Just following on from the point that you have the right to make that, at least for the time being, uh, the US having announced its departure for the Paris Agreement, really, uh, China has to be a major driver, if not the major driver. And of course, the next step under the Paris agreement is what is called the ratcheting up of commitments. Commitments made at Paris, as everyone knows, globally fall far short of what is needed even to limit global warming to two degrees. And the next step is supposed to be that governments for 2020, for the, for the 2020 meeting of the, uh, the conference of the parties, ratchet up their commitments. And it seems to me that for that to be a success, the contribution of China will be very, very important. So I, maybe it's an impossible question, but I ask the panel, does, does China have scope? Does it have potential, in your view, to ratchet up its, uh, its commitments in that sort of time scale? That was a difficult question. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. I think this actually reflects exactly what the role that um, I think the NGOs or philanthropic communities are assuming for themselves. So, um, as a all independent organizations, we are actually taking this responsibility to work together with both Chinese and also European and U.S. and even Japanese partners. To, for example, this is one of the projects we are now actually supporting to look at the trajectories of the 
um, those most major emitter uh, regions in terms of meeting their targets, me meeting their commitments, and to also updating that yearly, annually, to look at what the potential is for them to even raise that potential. So at this moment, I think we can say that China is well on track of meeting its own um, targets for 2020. And um, um, just as Professor Michael just mentioned today, sometimes, um, and also con considering what you, we just described about how China sets a target, the target is always set by the level that they can actually be sure they will meet. So there's always space for us to push higher um, for Chinese targets. But I think there's also, um, in order to make that happen, you also need to make the government feel confident about the perspective of economic development, the geopolitical play out, and also the potential uh, resolution of the trade issues. So I think if we didn't really say a more friendly international environment towards more cooperative and trustful uh, partnership on climate change towards 2020, I think even China could do that, they probably wouldn't do it uh, or commit to that at the international level. But nevertheless, I think they will still keep moving for that. But you just don't say it as a national target. But still, that is um, quite possible. I think we may have time for one more question, unless... Actually, we'll do two questions. Thank you. Okay, let's start. Cool. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a question where I would like to ask, uh, if you turn around the um, title of the session from Paris to Beijing, to, to, from Beijing to Paris, uh, I'm Danish, and in Denmark there's a strong link, uh, or there is a clear common interest between um, the um, policy interest and the economic interest uh, of the, the Danish business sector in international climate policy. Is there such a link uh, to China? So you, you mean in terms of supply chain and? In terms of uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, working with the, the corporate sector, the solution sector in the green economy. Uh, in terms of export interest. I see. So, in other words, export of Danish technology no, to China? Uh, no, um, <laughs> uh, no. No, for, for China, not okay. Denmark. Let's just use Denmark as an example. Okay, so, so well, and, and I think... Are, are there trade interests behind absolutely the, the China absolutely. policy? Yeah, so I, I can touch on a few, and I'm sure that Tao and Jong can as well. Um, so, the, for example, the Ministry of Science and Technology maintains a, uh, a comprehensive book of export technologies in the clean energy space that they have helped fund and develop. And I've actually worked with them in Africa, uh, helping them promote exports, which is unusual for a foreigner to do. But um, the, um, then there's also, um, I am aware that uh, on some of the Belt Road projects, groups from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment have been sent out to do evaluations of Bell Road projects from an environmental point of view in order to kind of certify their greenness. And these are uh, also export oriented. Um, and then there's a literature, um, I don't know if it might be cited in the study, um, where um, there definitely are commercial interests in the Arctic, uh, the, uh, the, ex the research and exploration being done in the Arctic, which has a, a climate component, also has uh, oil and gas uh, exploration components. So there is unquestionably, and if you look at almost, I believe, I, I, I want to say every, but I can't say every for certain, but every bilateral agreement that I have looked at, there are now about 60 that we've collected between China and other countries, all have a trade element. To it. So there's always, uh, from, from, from what I have seen, there is always, in fact, a trade element. There's a, an aspect of China building a, uh, a, a solar PV farm or a wind farm in some of these countries that it develops uh, climate cooperation agreements with. So it's ever present, I'd say. Let's make it a, a quick lightning round. Do you, have, do you have a quick answer for this? And then, I just want to make sure that we can get Bob in before we have to wrap up. Yeah. Maybe ask, ask and then we'll. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. Um, we heard that uh, at Poland there was discussions about a national emissions trading, China's cooperation with the, the, the EU and California and different groups with regards to that issue. Uh, Craig, you may deal with this in your, in your paper, but, but what, I mean, moving from the pilot to the national system, how is that going? What's the implementation issues? That's a key question, I think. And the relationship with the energy reforms is also critical. And I know at State Department, when I was there, we, we were beginning to develop a pilot activity in, with regards to market reforms and unbundling in some of the regions. And I think that's going ahead, and hopefully it's still going ahead. But uh, any updates? So um, the carbon market is set, the national carbon market is set to start trading in 2020 on a compliance basis. I believe that's the new revised number. It's only the electricity sector, but even with that limited sector, it's still three times the size of the EU. Um, one of, and I cover this in some detail, one of the major issues is that data is not being made available on emissions. That creates all kinds of challenges with keeping, you know, trading credits in a market where you don't have emitter level information makes things rather challenging. It also opens up opportunities for insider trading that are deeply distressing. Um, and uh, I know from interviewing that um, even something is as um, innocent as a, well, you know, government might do an auction the supply going up and that means the price going down potentially you know even something like a, a very general comment can can open doors for insider information so that's a deep concern that uh, I, I have expressed in here but also in other public published work in the Nikkei Asia review if you want to look at it um, also uh, Ma Jun of the uh, IPE that does wonderful work he has expressed very similar views for we're in agreement on this. Um, the electricity reform is going forward, but it's halting. And it's, it's province by province, and there's still a lot of experimentation. Uh, it's very much a work in progress. I think I should turn the mic over, though, to um, Jong In, because this is he, the core of you know, his department, and DRC leads that work. Say some of my, my own views. We can very simply to understand uh, the, 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 these uh, situations. What what means you can? You will say China government and uh, climate change, China government and the Paris Agreement. We just should understand what's the so far present situation for China. My own view of in China, climate change issues, Paris Agreement, need the Paris Agreement, and uh, domestic environment issues is the same issues. Is the same issues. Why? I already said our energy mix almost 90% depends on the fossil fuels. This is the big problems, big problems for us. Even influence our economic transition. Our economic want to develop, we must reduce our energy emission. emission. So no way. So there's no way. So, this is the one. The second, from my own view, in China, electricity market reform, more important, carbon trading system, carbon trading system. I don't think so far, so far the in China, carbon trading uh, can give the big help. Because the China to the you know the how how much coal power plant in China hundred gigawatt uh, uh, one thousand gigawatt 
1,000 gigawatt Quran. Every year, annual running hours about 4,000 hours. How much emission? I have to say, say the CO2, just local pollution. We cannot accept this. If we can reduce the running hours from 4,000 hours to the 2,000 hours, how much market space for the renewable energy? Everybody can this. So, that's my answer. Well, um, sadly, we have to wrap up. I'm sure we could stay here if we had the time and keep going. Um, but I want to thank our three panelists so much um, for coming here and sharing their expertise with us. Um, and thank you to you all for such a lively discussion. And um, please continue to enjoy the rest of your time at the Global Energy Forum. Thank you.